made, is made up of three bands, the Skitty or the Wolf Band. Uh, Roger will probably laugh when I pronounce this one, the Pitaharet or the Tappage Band, the Chowie or the Grand, and the Kickahockey or the Republican Bands. The three that I mentioned last are called the Southern Bands. Okay, this, I want to talk a little bit about some of their sacred areas. They had um, five sacred areas of Naharek, which is their sacred animal lodges. There was one. Oh, there it goes. There was one at Pahuk, which is by Fremont. There was one by Fullerton. There was one down by Clark's. Then there was one over uh, down by uh, on the Republican River by Guide Rock, and then there's one down on the Solomon River by in Kansas. And you can see, I was going to point out, most of the villages we will talk about, the known Pawnee ones, were within this triangle of these three sacred sites. So you can see why they kind of stayed in this area if these were very sacred areas to them. This was White Cliff, the Fuller part of the Fullerton site. This was from like a, a 1902 photograph and it didn't come out very well. But you can see the ladies in their long dresses sitting on the edge of the cliff. This is a better one. The Animal Lodge would have been down here at the base of the cliff. And it was, uh, they're called White Cliff just because of the white lusts, windblown lust that has come in and built up these huge hills. The Cedar River used to flow through there. Uh, I've gone back and looked at old uh, photographs, and in the 1960s, there was a big flood that went through there, and it actually moved the Cedar River about a quarter of a mile north of where it, yeah, the bluffs are now. Um, this is Pahuk down by uh, Fremont, and you're up on a very big hill, and it's overlooking the river there. Now I'm going to go back in time and try to start with one of the earliest sites that we can attribute to the Pawnee. This one is called the Burkett site. Here we are up on top of this high bluff overlooking the Loop River. Yeah, it's a little bit better view here. This is a bluff is about 200 feet up above the river. You know this is before they had horses because if they would have had horses, you wouldn't have wanted to carry your water all the way up here or have to take your horses all the way down the hill. This was a side of about 100 acres. They had 57 um, earth lodges on it and it was located west of Genoa about right there. They, um, this is an example of an excavated lodge from there. They were not real large ones. And you can tell this was an early earth lodge because they had four center posts. All these little dots are examples of the earth lodges that they excavated there. And when you've been up, I've been up there several times and it's a very peaceful place. So it would have been before there would have maybe been a lot of uh, warfare going on. It dates from about the 1600s. And this is a photograph from the 1937, an aerial one. And each one of these little dots shows where they, the university had excavated um, earth lodges. Also about the same time, but extending to a later period, because here was the Burkett, and we go on over to, it's called the Wright Umbarger site. And you can see there's also an early site with just the four center post. And these date from about the 1625 to about 1725. Uh, the right site part of it was be just because of landowners' names, they were assigned that. But the village was located along here, along this high bluff overlooking Beaver Creek. In this area here on top of the hill, there was a large uh, earth lodge that shows one of the first evidences of warfare in the area. There was a burnt earth lodge that had 50 um, skeletons that had been burnt inside. So 
there had been a major massacre there. The Umbarger part of it is this little part right here. You can see that it was very start, um, steep sides that go almost straight down to the valley below, and they just had this little connecting area. And on across this little connecting area, there was a earth, a sod wall had been built. So you know that they were using that as protection. They were using this also, um, since this was such a little area there, it really hasn't been farmed. And so you can still see the depressions from those earth lodges now. Still about the same time, with still, and it's still the Skitty Band, there was eight villages along just a little farther downstream on the Loop River. They, um, let me see. One of the village sites there was called the Hill Roop site. And you can see based on the artifacts that were found there that it was before really much contact with uh, the Europeans. Uh, it was on, also up on high bluffs and they were overlooking like the uh, different creeks that fed right into the Loop River Valley which was right there. Another site that was part of it was the Hannah Larson site and uh, this was on a very tall hill and there would have been a, a very large, um, it was quite a large village. And these villages dated from about the 1680s to about 1730. If we proceed down the Loop River, which is this one, where it dumps into the Platte, follow the Platte down a little ways, and then back up Shell Creek a, mi a couple of miles, we come to another skiddy village or villages because it's called the Wolf Gray site and they're not sure whether that was just one village or several villages. And um, depending upon the dates and who you read, some, this one said it was from about 1500 to about 1650. Others of them say that they're about the 1600s to the middle 1700s. But uh, the, it, uh, just a moment. But as I say, carbon dating and stuff is, is pretty uh, within a range there. So that's why it's within this time period and was before uh, very much contact with Europeans. But as you can see, they are getting closer and closer. This was a lot closer to um, the uh, European contact to the east, so they would have started getting uh, more contact there. About the same time, or just a little bit later, the Grand Band shows up. Before, all of these other villages were the Skitty Band. The, now the Grand Band shows up here, and it is on the, it's called the Barcel or Skull Creek Village. And it's from about 1750 to 1770, and it, this was the first one to have evidence of horses. So prior to that, they didn't have horses. Here, there was evidence that they had had horses. And here's just a little bit more about it. And there was also um, evidence that they had uh, other European contacts. And they had horse corrals that they uncovered and a lot of different things, which was quite interesting. The next one was um, way south on the Republican River. It's called the Hill Site. Uh, it was, it's the first known Kickahawkee or Republican village, and it dates from about 1770 to about 1810. Uh, though this is it's a little controversial with the site in Kansas, Supposedly, Zebulon Pike visited this site in 1806 and described it, and later re a recovery of these peace medals helped to confirm that that was the village he was talking about. Supposedly, this site was also dis visited by a Spanish expedition led by Malgarez. This village had over 100 lodges, and an interesting thing about this is it supposedly had two hoop game courts, which is something more related to the Southwest uh, uh, 
Indians rather than uh, what you would see up here with the Pawnee. The Grand Band made the Linwood site, which is right here, um, from 1777 to 1809. And this village was occupied in 1804 and was reported on by the Lewis and Clark expedition. And also in 1806, it was visited by Pike. So there's quite a bit of, now we're getting into the area where there's a lot of uh, documentation about where these villages were and what they had there. The Grand Band also made a village over by Bellwood. And this was from 1795 to 1800. So they kind of switched from one to the other and back again. This one was um, on a small terrace right south of the Platte River. And another thing I forgot to mention was, it's kind of interesting, the Skeedy were always on the north side of the uh, rivers, and now the southern bands have been on the south side of the rivers to start out, which I found quite interesting. Maybe nobody else does, but I did. Um, this is the Linwood site, and it was mentioned, as I said, in the Lewis and Clark journals, and um, and other people reported on it. And as I said, there's over 100 earth lodges there. And there's also a possible ceremonial structure. And I have, didn't get to Lincoln to find out for sure what that was on. And then we have the, um, then we have the Bellwood site, which is here. And first they said it was from like 1650 to 1750, and I don't know for sure which band that was. And then later on they were visited again and, by, uh, and lived there again from about 1795 to about the 1800s. So this one is a site that if you would like to see the differences before contact with Europeans and after contact with Europeans, it's rather prominent in the articles that they had. Another thing that I did up here was we have a site here, some artifacts from the Burkett site, which was before contact, and then we have artifacts over here from the Genoa site, which was after contact, and you can see the different types of utensils and things that they used based on after and before contact. Then the Skeedy were f over here at this and kind of here along all these at the same time. Then a big portion of them moved to what is called, called the Palmer site. And they were there from the 1770s to the um, 1884. And um, this one was visited by ver a lot of people, such as uh, Major Shibley, Sibley, Stephen Long, Morris, as you can see, and John Dunbar in 39. They said that there was between 64 and 145 earth lodges. And when you consider that in each earth lodge there was between 50 and 30 people, there was a lot of people in this earth lodge, in this village here. One of the things is it's one of the best preserved um, sites because a portion of this has never been farmed. And you can see up here, this was where one of the earth lodges were. And I think here was another one. Um, but uh, Mr. Russell just informed me that it has changed hands. And so we hope the new owners are as protective of it as the old owners were. Then while the Skeedy were there, the um, Horse Creek Village, which is by where the Russells live, was in, a, uh, in operation from like 1809 to 1842. And during this, this village had various states by the different uh, three of the south bands. And this is all located on 40 acres. And here the Sibley and Long and other ones reported on it. 
and then uh, Dunbar, John Dunbar reported it abandoned in 1842. And this square um, part, I am not sure exactly what that uh, represented. John, do you have an idea? No. Well, there was post holes along there, so I originally thought it was maybe an entryway to the earth lodge, but that's too far apart. They wouldn't have had it that far apart, so this could have been something like a, a little remote where they would have built a shade over it and maybe just worked under it and with open sides. But that's actually kind of an unusual feature for, um, for the villages. And I was going to say, well, I'll talk a little bit more about John Dunbar in a minute. And at the same time that the three, um, that the three south ones were here in Horse Creek, some of them moved over to, on Cottonwood Creek, which were the Kikahaki and the Tappage Band moved over there and lived there for a while also until 1840. Too. And you can see that these are also older, um, newer earth lodges because there's more than four center post. Uh, Major Stephen Long visited this uh, site and they had 50 lodges. So you can see it was a smaller village than the Horse Creek site was. While the three south bands were there, some of the skeedy moved from the Palmer site over to what we call the Cunningham site. And that was, um, they were there from, just a second, in the 1830s, and it was the Skeedy Band. And then in 1914, uh, one of, White Eagle came up from Pawnee and went around with some of the anthropologists from the university and described where different things was. And he said this was the site of the last human sacrifice to the Morning Star Ceremony. And um, he told them where to dig, and they actually did find uh, two burnt post holes and some burnt ground. So this was uh, actually a very interesting site to have found. Um, this is a photo of uh, White Eagle. This is looking up to the top of the area where the ceremony was held. And this is kind of looking to the northeast. Here we're up on top where the ceremony was held. The burnt post holes would have been right here. This is a small creek that feeds down into the Loop River. Those trees would have not been there, so you would have been able, they would have been able to see the sunrise when it first came up over the horizon, and that was part of their ceremony. The actual village itself, we're looking down from the hill, and this is the Loop River and the actual village itself was on this flat area just north of the Loop River. Then the Grant moved their village to Clark's, which is here, cl very close to the um, Dark Island, and they were there from 1840, 1820 to 1840s. And other bands actually came down there and lived in the 40s, too, and I'll explain why on that in just a little bit. Then we also have the Hordeville site, which is also down here on the Platte River. And um, it was also from the 1830s to 1840s, and this was the village that was mentioned by a Major Horton in 1844 in his journal. And material at this site included flint and pottery, a steel pipe tomahawk, and a Spanish axe. Now, in, from 1841 to 1846, Samuel Allison, John Dunbar, now you all know the name John Dunbar from Dances with Wolves. Well, actually, they're a real John Dunbar, lived with the Pawnee and worked with them. Uh, they worked with the Pawnee in the, in the mid-1930s, they started. In 1841, they established the Pawnee Mission with a school, a blacksmith, and they were there to not only teach the children, but to teach farming methods to the Pawnee men. 
and the the site the mission site was actually on uh, Council Creek and here we are looking to the west and this is Council Creek and the, the um, actual mission buildings were uh, right along on that creek. They convinced the th three of the south vans to build a village just to the west between Council and Plum Creek in 1842. In 1846 the Sioux attacked the mission and while most of the Pawnee were on their summer hunting trip. This caused Dunbar and Alice to vacate the mission and take the 20 Pawnee children that were staying with them because they had convinced the Pawnee that the children would be safer there than they would out on their hunting trip and he took these children to Bellevue. Later that same year, members of the Pioneer Morgan Wagon Train came out and harvested the mission crops. This helped the Mormons survive that very first winter at Winter Quarters in Florence. And there is a um, nice sign put up by the Park Service uh, that commemorates the Mormon Trail and their, their harvesting of their food there. I just want to tell you, I've done a little bit of research and I've never been able to find out how soon the Pawnee parents were able to find their children. But you know that they usually went to the, um, the agent who is on the Missouri River once a year to get their uh, rations or whatever, and so hopefully they were able to find them later that year, because when they came back, everything was, would have been gone from their hunting trip. So we're going to talk about Plum Creek, or I call it Burnt Village. This is where the three South Bands came to work with the missions in 1842. Um, and they were, the, mis the village site actually was there until 1846 in some respect. I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about this uh, site. The, um, we're looking to the north here. The, uh, the village actually is kind of where I was standing to take the picture. The highway runs right through that. And south of the, of the highway is a little high ledge before you drop off to the uh, Loop River. And the village was like right in this area. And these bluffs to the north are much higher than they look in this photograph. It was a dawn. On June 27, 1843, when a Pawnee took his horses out of the village and turned them loose on some good grass by the river, and then he laid down and he went to sleep. However, nearby were some Sioux lurking in the bushes, and they killed him and started to drive his horses towards these bluffs to the north. The, a cry went up and some of the Pawnee warriors mounted their horses and gave chase. By the time that they got about halfway up here to the bluffs, when they got there, all along this ridge came over between 300 and 500 mounted Sioux warriors. The, the party of Pawnee warriors quickly returned back to their village to try to protect it. However, some of the Sioux followed them down, set fire to an earth lodge or two, grabbed some horses, and went back up to the top of the hill. But as, when they were getting about up there, another wave of Sioux came down. And this wave after wave continued, setting fire to this Pawnee village and killing and plundering it. This went on until noon. Remember, it started at dawn. And by noon, some Pawnee from the Platte River villages about 15 miles south, remember the Clarks and the Hordeville villages we talked about, they were able to get up there about noon because they had seen all this smoke and knew something was really bad. So when they got there, the Sioux did withdraw. And after they left, 20 of the 41 new lodges were burnt, 67 Pawnee were killed, and 26 were wounded. At this point, many of the Pawnee who were living there left. And the whites at the mission viewed this and recorded this story. 
the whites did not take part because there was only like five or six of them there and they knew that there was nothing that they could do. Now at this time also a few of the Pawnees still stayed at that village because I, I, for some reason, I don't know why. At the same time that the three South Vans did the um, Plum Creek, there was, a, I'm not sure if I'm pointing right, over at the mouth of the Cedar River where it dumps into the Loop River was what we call the Fullerton site. That's where the Skiddy um, established a village. And this one um, was also in operation from 1843 to 1846. The Skiddy uh, did a little bit of different um, village uh, making. They built a sod fortification around their village. And the reason that they said they did not go to help the South Bands when they were being attacked, evidently they had sent some people out there to, and they saw how many Sioux they were. And since they were just a few miles down the road, they figured they would come there and attack there and kill them also. So they did not, part, why they did not partake in this to help the, um, the South Bands over at Plum Creek. The village was attacked, however. The, some of the people from Plum Creek, after it was attacked in 43, moved over to and joined the Skiddy. So they opened their village up and had some of the people come over there. But this did not last long because in 1846, they were, this village was attacked by the, the Sioux and actually totally destroyed. Because in 1847, when the first uh, Mormon uh, wagon train was going through Clayton, a journalist on the train, uh, recorded this. Only one of the 200 earth lodges were intact in the village and it was enclosed by a five foot wide ditch and a four foot high embankment. So you knew that they knew that they were trying to protect themselves but it still uh, wasn't enough. So after this was burnt, the um, many of the grand band went back to Linwood where they had had a uh, village for a while and they some of them were there from the 1851 to 1857. The Skiddy um, established Lissara which uh, was also in operation from 1851 to 1857. The Skiddy and the Repu some of the Republicans went there. This was located on a, a high bluff overlooking the Platte River. And this was reported on by White Eagle and um, Thayer and the Mormons also passed by this way. And then the other, some more um, Skeety and the Tappage Band also established a village called McLean during that same time period on a bluff overlooking the Platte River. And that was about five miles from the other village. And this one had a sod fortification around it and was also reported on it. So a lot of them had moved closer to the European influence and settlements in the eastern part of Nebraska just so they could be safe from the Sioux attacks. Well, by 1857, a lot of the Europeans were wanting to uh, farm in these areas and they were, a lot of them were moving out into this area and causing problems for the Pawnee. And so f because of that and that the fact that the government promised the Pawnee that they would help protect them. Oh, I got a little bit ahead of myself. This was the McLean site. And if you want to read more about it, the Monrovian Church had a lot of information on it. But the uh, Treaty of Table Creek is what the Pawnee signed. The four bands of the Pawnee signed this and that is where they gave up claim to all of Nebraska except the area now known as Nance County. And it was through this that they were promised uh, protection and um, a school and various things. 
Cynthia Forband signed it, they gathered for a large reservation village which had over 3,500 Pawnee and over 200 earth lodges. This was from 1857 to 1859. Here is just a sum of the 200 earth lodges. They're looking to the north. Right here is where the, um, the agency building and the farm buildings were located. Beaver Creek ran between them. Now it is covered with trees, but at that time, of course, everybody was using the lumber for building things and for firewood. Here is the uh, photograph of the actual agent's and farmer's house and the barn where they were teaching uh, the Pawnee men to grow corn, which was totally against what they had always done. Here is the, another view farther to the east, and here was the large brick schoolhouse that they had built for the Pawnee children. This is a view from 71 of the children in front of the schoolhouse. And this is probably my favorite of the Pawnee children in front of the schoolhouse. I love how they can just hang out the windows and it, I, I just love this picture. This is from 1861, a map. From the, it's from the Hyde book. This is where the village, or if I was, I have been corrected by Mr. Uh, Echo Hawk that when you have a village of about 3,500 people, it is no longer considered a village. This is a town, this Pawnee town, and the Skeedy had their lodges to the west, the Pilaharat and the Chowee and the Kikihaki, and here is the Beaver Creek and the Loop River. And I can see the Skiddy had some influence because they had a, built a sod wall around their village to the south to protect them there. Here was the edge of the reservation and just outside of it there was two trading posts, Willards and Platt. And um, on the different high banks was the different cemeteries. And it was up here at the Kickahawkee Cemetery is where over here this picture on the far end was taken that overlooks the Loop River Valley. Um, this is just a photograph of Platt's trading post. There are tales about um, how the in Pawnee were able to uh, trick him uh, several times, which, and it, it's pretty funny when you can hear a Pawnee tell about it. Here they are uh, sitting around the center of the village conducting important business. Um, they set up on their homes, they, they would get a breeze there, plus it was just a nice place to be able to see a lot of things. Um, this village though, even though they were promised protection, was attacked numerous times. In 1860, over 250 Sioux attacked this village and burned 60 of the lodges. This actually finally got the government to do a little bit. They were able to organize the 2nd Nebraska Calvary, Company K, and they built barracks on the northwest corner of the village to try to help protect them. Then other companies that were stationed there was Nebraska Company D, Company E, the 7th Iowa, and the 12th Missouri. And then on October 21st, 1865, Company A of the Pawnee Scouts was organized under Luther North. And I always like to say, oh, gee, this would be a nice one to um, say that this was where they were being organized. But it was, I think it was when the annuities were being handed out. Um, here are four of the Pawnee Scouts. Um, they actually did a very good job for, not only for the village, but for the United States Army. They were in various campaigns and were highly re uh, regarded they went farther out west into uh, western Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, and helped the Army there. They also guarded the Union Pacific Railroad as it laid its tracks west. But unfortunately, after being unfairly treated by the government and still attacked by the Sioux, all of the Pawnee then did move t to Oklahoma in 1875. Now the Danabrog Pawnee location, unfortunately, is not listed by the State Historical Society. 
Now, sometime we need to get out and see, find some artifacts from that location and actually get it listed. However, it is a known fact that there were 300 Pawnee down by the river when the Danes came in April of 1871. And by, and there were 500 there by Christmas. Dr. Donna Roper from the Kansas State Historical Society, or Kansas, University of Kansas at, um, excuse me, she's from Kansas State, and she would be upset if I gave, when gave her to Key University. She's done research on Pawnee, Pawnee hunting camps in Nebraska and says that there are five types of hunting camps, which are overnight base camps at kill sites, base camps, kill sites, and winter quarters. The winter quarter camp is, more po uh, is a more permanent camp with the Pawnee using it year after year. In 1871, the Pawnee would have been living at the Genoa site and they had a lot of horses at that time. But remember with horses you have to find the forage for them to eat to keep them alive. So they needed the grass and then when the snow came they also could use cottonwood bark to help feed the horses. So they would have had to keep moving all winter to feed their horses. And when you think about it, Danabrog is just a little bit west of the west end of the Pawnee Reservation. So if they would have started out uh, on their hunt, they would have been uh, not too far and could have been protected and could have returned back to the reservation if they needed to. In December, if they, um, they would have just been basically at the start of their winter buffalo hunt. And so they would have, and when you consider that they didn't travel very many miles each day, they would have been at Danabrog maybe on their second or third day and needed to have rested up the horses, get them fed up. And so they would have been here maybe for several weeks to get everybody uh, back in shape again and then continued westward on their bison hunt. In April, they would have been on their way back home to the reservation, and so they would have stopped there again to have uh, fed their horses and get them uh, ready to go back to the reservation. So I think that the Danabrog site was used, um, um, excuse me, <laughs> I think this was probably one of their permanent stops and that they used it year after year and several times a year, but it probably wasn't actual, uh, a permanent um, village site with earth lodges. I think there was probably more, um, use more of the teepees, but I would get, like to look at it, see if we could ever find evidence of earth lodges there and prove me wrong, because we don't, I don't know for sure. I wanted to just go through a little, oh, I've, I thought that was a nice picture of Roger. <laughs> I'm just going to go through a little bit really quickly just to show you because I know dates and times is kind of confusing. This is for where the Skeedy were in this general area. They started out at the Burkett, then there's some went on over to the right side, and then they were in these eight villages. This was all along on the Loop River. Then they were also down over, uh, uh, just a little bit off the Platte River at the Gray Wolf site. Then I think there was too much um, European crowding and they're starting to come into the area. So then they went over to the Palmer site and then some of them were over at the Cunningham site. From there, they were um, moved up to the Fullerton site and from the Fullerton site, some of them moved back to the Cunningham site, then they went after they were being burned out there at the Fullerton site, then they all went over far east for protection around the McLean site. And from the McLean site, then they were moved into the Genoa Reservation. And part of that, during the reservation period, they would have been at Diana Brog. That is what we know of some of the known sites. As I said before, there are a lot of villages that we don't know for sure. This is the Grand Band. They started out at uh, Barcel site and then the Linwood site and Bellwood site. So they didn't move very much until they moved out to Horse Creek. 
then there were Clarks and Hordville, then up to Plum Creek or Burnt Village, then back to some of these sites, then over to Linwood, the Lasara site, and then to the Genoa site. And this is the Republican or the Kiki Hockey. They were first seen down on the Republican River. Then they came up to, uh, let me see, Horse Creek, and then some of them went over to the Cottonwood site. Then they were down into the Hordeville area. Let's see, and then they were, well, take off those glasses. Up to Plum Creek there, because then they, from there they went up there and the, the missionaries convinced them, Dunbar convinced them to move up there. They're up there, then they, a lot of them got burnt out and killed, so then they went over with the Skeety on Fullerton one, then they got attacked there, so then they went down back to Clark's, and from Clark's, and they went up to the Linwood, and some of them went over to Lasara, and then it was back to Genoa. So they moved in this general area. And then the Tappage, or the band, they started out at Horse Creek. That, that This is the first place that we can really identify this band. And they didn't move around as much because then some of them were also over at Horse Creek during the same time period and from here. So they were here for a long period of time. Then they went up to the Plum Creek site, over to the Fullerton site. Then they went to the McLean site and back to Genoa. And I should say the the band that I just used the Skitty as the band that was at the Danabrog site. I don't know for sure it was that it was the Skitty band. It could have been any of these bands or a mixture of all of these bands. And it probably was a mixture of all of these bands that were out on the bison hunt together that stopped at Danabrog. Some of the more recent things to do with the Pawnees that I wanted to show you about. This is the Nance County Veterans Memorial in uh, Fullerton and um, this uh, flagpole. Uh, they, when they were planning it, um, Jerry and uh, Philip Swantek went over there and said, well, the first uh, Army uh, soldiers from this area were the Pawnee Scouts, and so we have to honor them and so uh, we went on and purchased a flagpole for them, and now they fly the Pawnee flag there, which we're uh, very fortunate that they do. And there we also have a, a Pawnee Scout brick for them there. And this is Pat Le Chief Pat Leading Fox, and he has been up several times, and he's a very enjoyable to talk to if you ever get the chance. Also in Genoa, is uh, the Pawnee Memorial because so many of the um, Pawnee were excavated and the remains were in museums and other institutions. Nebraska was the first state to uh, enact the NAGPRA law, which is the Native American Graves Protection Act law. And since we only had one legislature one legislative body in the state, they got the law passed through in Nebraska first, and the Pawnee were very active at that, and I believe Roger was very involved in that also, weren't you? Yeah. And um, so uh, in 1990, which was just right when the law was passed, they were able to obtain almost 400 of the Pawnee in these institutions, and we bury them in Genoa, and then in 95, there was over um, 400 more. So there's over 800 Pawnee reburied here. And when you think about it, uh, you know that the 50 skeletons that were found up in that massacre site by the right site are reburied here, which is less than a mile from where they were uh, found in their lodge. So most of these Pawnee that have been reburied here have come home and they are buried there in a, steel, in a concrete vault to hopefully remain there forever. Um, these six um, Indian War markers are in honor of the six Pawnee Scouts that are reburied there. 
On special occasions, we also fly the Pawnee flag and the United States flag in their honor. And it always is very interesting because anytime you stop by there, there's always something new that has been placed there. If they have nothing else, usually it's tobacco or a penny or if they have nothing else, they will place a stone here. And um, Jerry oftentimes puts his corn there. Uh, the Pawnee have come back up several times and done a homecoming dance. In 2000, they were in Genoa and did a homecoming dance. Uh, a couple other things associated with uh, the Pawnee in recent times uh, is growing Pawnee corn for the Pawnee. And um, hopefully it won't take too long here. Um, Jerry acquired, my husband Jerry acquired some Pawnee seed after visiting the Pawnee Indian Village site at, in Republic, Kansas and he decided to reintroduce the Pawnee corn onto the fields that the Pawnee women had planted their corn almost 140 years ago. So from this map you can see these were the Indian fields of their corn and these were the two locations that he had picked to plant the corn. Um, and this was in 2003. After that he started working with Deb Heck Gohawk who is a Pawnee that is working with reintroducing their Pawnee corn and Ronnie O'Brien at the Archway. Um, this first year he was kind of on his own because he didn't realize a lot of this other stuff was going on. The fact that this area was all planted to soybeans we thought was wonderful because Pawnee corn can cross-pollinate with other things very easily and you do not want it to cross-pollinate. The one thing we weren't aware of was that along the Beaver Creek there were a lot of little animals that love corn <laughs> and so that fact was noted later. Jerry selected uh, two varieties, a spotted corn which is the pearly white and we, you can look at it later, there's some right over here in this basket and with a uh, black on it. It's also called an eagle corn because it looks like a flying eagle on each one of the kernels and also a blue flower corn. Now he planted 160 seeds of the eagle corn and 200 kernels of the blue flower corn and it was kind of interesting when he planted the blue flower corn here the um, some artifacts actually showed up so we thought that was a very good omen. He also planted some skeety popcorn uh, out by our home. Germination was very good. It was 90%. And when you have old corn, you never think that you're probably going to last. But it did 90%. And so we're off to a really good start. But it was not for very long because soon the spotted corn, after it emerged, emerged the ground squirrels, squirrels came over and destroyed half of the crop. We looked at our reference books and discovered that this was not a new problem. Buffalo bird women in the early 1990s talked about her, act, uh, her practices and said, our cornfields had many enemies, magpies, especially crows, pulled up much of the corn. Also spotted gophers would dig up the, sword, the seed from and eat, destroy the young plants. Then our attempts to duplicate the Pawnee corn growing practices were modified. The references said we were to plant, water, heal our corn, and then leave and go on a buffalo hunt. However, uh, we visited the plots almost daily. And at Early Tassel, the neighbor's horse escaped and visited the corn patch which left us with only 18 surviving plants. Plus, there were many tracks in the mud revealed that it's being watched also by raccoons. So, after we read some more reports and where they said uh, the women surrounded their fields with fences built of stakes or they were protected by fences of bushes and trees woven together, we went back and, uh, oh, another one said, one job for, was for small boys during this process was to drive the horses away, for it was almost impossible to keep them from eating corn. And in the lo Prairie Log Books of 1844, when uh, they had visited the Clark site, they said, 
Their fields of corn were literally fenced in by sunflowers curiously woven together. And this was able to keep out many of the plants. And they said when they visited it, it they, all the sunflowers were in full bloom and it was a beautiful sight. This was by the in Carlton. So it was decided that the next day we were gonna fence the blue flower corn. However, that night, deer went in and bit off every emerged tassel. However, we still fenced in with a four foot high woven wire fence and two feet farther out, we put two lines of electric fence. And for the remaining spotted corn, each hill, oh, this is just the plants emerging and you can see how small and tiny they are. They're just like grass, not weeds, uh, not corn. They're, they're very thin stacks. This was some of the artifacts that the native Pawnee women used to plant their corn. But here is the spotted corn. And at first he put just a, a, a cage around it, but then he had to do more. Um, let's see. He uh, wrapped each with woven wire and then rewrapped it with chicken wire to protect it. <laughs> and the skiddy corn was also fenced. We had a very dry growing season, but they're all near water and they were irrigated several times. The spotted corn matured at only 23 inches tall. So you can see this was 23 inches tall, the stalk, and you can see how small it was. And the um, ear was five inches long. So it was very near to the ground and was very um, accessible. Yeah, the blue flower corn, however, did grow to be about four and four and a half feet long. Okay, we wanted to leave the corn in the field to mature as long as possible to be sure we'd have viable corn for the next year. Obviously, our harvest was about 16 hours too late because when we went in there, the um, little corns, the husk had been opened and field mice had gone in and carried away every kernel except for on six ears. So um, Jerry had six ears of the um, eagle corn, although he did get more uh, of the blue flower corn. And we've been lucky enough to um, be able to share that with Apani, and now Jerry works on the works with Ronnie O'Brien and Deb Echohawk and plants different varieties each year and sends most of it back to Pawnee. And so they're trying to get that going within the Pawnee Nation. Another thing we did, since I'm an archaeologist and I was always unearthing the ground and finding post holes and different things. I thought, well, it'd be kind of interesting to see it from the other angle and to help build an earth lodge. So when the Ponca were building an earth lodge up by Niobrara, we went up to help. Well, we uh, got up there and uh, the one thing we got to do was to scrape bark after every one of these poles, because of course that would help protect it, but that's the only thing we did. But and we got to help set it in some of the ground. But this is in the process of being made. And this is where the finished earth lodge. And we was, thought we did quite a good job on it, but evidently we didn't do a very good job because several years later they said part of it had uh, caved in. And then of course the punk had told us that's because you white people helped build it, so. <laughs> Um, when the Pawnee left for Oklahoma, their large school building, and this right here is a picture of it, and you can look on this a little later too if you want. The brick building stood there. I think some squatters in the area used it for a school for a year or two, but the federal government still owned it. And when the philosophy of the government was that they were going to take Native American children and, quote, civilized them, they started the federal boarding school system. They started at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and when they thought that was a success, then in 1884, they started three other schools, and one of them was at Genoa, Nebraska, because they already had a school building there and considerable amount of land. 
the Genoa Federal Boarding School was in operation from 1884 to 1934, which was a long period of time. I will note that uh, very few Pawnee did come back up and go to school here. This was in part because some of the very first groups of people that they brought into this school were Sioux. So if you've just been fighting them and had to move away from your homeland because of these people, are you going to send your children back up to go to school with them? Probably not. Um, you can see it's run in military fashion. This was um, the manual training building, and this is the building that's still standing there and is used as an interpretive center. Um, they had classrooms, uh, and the children ranged from age 4 to 21 that attended school there. Um, they learned reading, writing, and arithmetic, and the vocation. Uh, when they came, they uh, lost their Native American clothes. They could speak only English, and uh, there was a lot of things that happened to them. And you, it's very interesting to hear former students talk about their time. This was an aerial view of when after the school closed. This whole area here was part of the school. They ended up with 640 acres and over 30 buildings, and the largest enrollment was 599 students in a year. And I'm uh, not going to go into any more about this other than to say uh, the Interpretive Center is open from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we have a big celebration the second Saturday in August. And people, are, it's always free and welcome to anybody who wants to come over there. And you can meet a lot of uh, really nice Native Americans there. Um, I was just going to point out a couple of things here. We have replicas of uh, a trade. This was 